Marks, and we're back with another quick cup of knowledge. Joining us today is Amanda Shelby. She's a registered veterinary technician with a specialty in anesthesia and analgesia. Thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You are part of the team of the Veterinary Anesthesia Nerds. Yeah, this year. Which yeah. is awesome, their inaugural symposium here. And one of the areas that you're focusing on educating is blood gas analysis, which I have to be honest, even <laughs> for me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of shrugging my shoulders with stress thinking about it. Why is it so intimidating, this topic, to so many of the in, of people in the industry, veterinarians and technicians? Yeah, absolutely. It is intimidating, and I think it's because we're running them on the most critical patients, so our stress level is already really high about the clinical situation we're in. Um, I'm hoping the presentation tomorrow will help us just work through it systematically, make it kind of a, a cycle as you do with your physical exams and consistent, same way every time. Um, and, if, and if you're a technician or a doctor that's not doing them routinely, it might give you a little confidence to know that you can recognize simple abnormalities and then when to call in the, the reinforcements for the more complex ones. Um, so it is intimidating. People do struggle with it, but it's, it's really chemistry and just balancing the equations. So hopefully I can break it down and describe it in a way they can walk away feeling a little more confident. That's... Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, I, ha I have no doubt. I have no doubt that you will. For people that are watching right now that want to get started in working more with blood gas um, analysis and, and monitoring, what tools do they need in their practice to get started? Yeah, so you're going to have to contact whatever equipment, uh, blood chemistry units you use. They probably have a blood gas analysis analyzer that they can bring in and add to your portfolio of what kind of diagnostics, blood work diagnostics you have available. So that would probably be the first step. Um, and then you really need lithium heparin syringes and someone who has practice skills to hit an artery. Uh, for arterial blood gas, that's not to say that you can't gain a lot of information from a blood gas machine using venous blood, and most of us can hit a vessel and get a venous sample. Um, I don't think that it's probably going to be as helpful for patients that are critical under anesthesia, a venous sample, but you can still see quite a bit from that, and the return on those analyzers is pretty quick. Uh, so sometimes you're just running them for electrolytes or ionized calcium, but the return on the amount of time you have to wait is so minimal that you get a lot of information quickly. You could run that on a chemistry unit, but it takes a little bit longer. So you may have more capabilities in your regular lab station than what you realize, but truly you'd have to add a piece of equipment and that's going to be your biggest financial burden to doing it. Then of course, understanding the information that it gives you when you do have those critical patients and you're looking at arterial samples. Right. So is this something that I technician who is not a specialty and doesn't have a specialty in anesthesia or analgesia can be doing in practice? Or is this something that you're really focused on teaching more in a specialty or critical setting? Well, it's definitely a resource that a practice would use if they had a higher critical care caseload and um, trauma surgeries or extremely uh, critical high uh, risk patient surgeries. So you're probably going to see this technology more so there. I think the most important thing is, yes, a technician, even that's not a VTS, it's a learning tool and a skill that if you work on, anyone and everyone can learn how to do this. Um, and, and the more frequently you get exposed to looking at blood gases, the more comfortable you get with being able to recognize what's going on and how to resolve some of those issues. Uh, the biggest thing I th think that we need to recognize, even if you want to say that you're not going to tackle interpretation of blood gases is that when you're monitoring a patient under anesthesia, what you see on that screen in many cases is a relatively non-invasive approach. So for example, we look at entitled CO2 uh, and we write down these readings and it's, it's the blood gas analysis gives you a behind the scenes view of what's happening, especially when it's arterial blood gas on the arterial or cellular level. And so it's important to realize that there can be discrepancies on what you see on your multi-parameter monitor and what really is happening behind the scenes. And those discrepancies happen at a higher incidence with critical patients. And I think it's important to recognize that you have to look at the whole picture and that there are tools out there that can give you a better view of that picture, blood gas analysis being one of them. And for the students that are listening right now that are maybe just getting 
a sprinkle of introduction of blood gas analysis in school. Can you explain a couple examples of critical cases where a blood gas analysis and interpretation is really going to make or break the success of the case? Yeah, I would say if you have primary or secondary respiratory disease, those cases can be really helpful, looking at oxygenation, not just acid-base um, blood gas analysis. I think those are going to be helpful. Some of your septic abdomens, you might see electrolyte abnormalities um, and metabolic acidosis. You're going to be able to recognize some of that. Um, lactate, I think, is also helpful in those uh, analyzers. Many of them will do glucose and lactate in addition to some of your true blood gas mm -hmm. values. Um, those cases are all going to be the ones that really help you um, tailor your, your medical treatment to optimize that patient's outcome. Pneumonia cases, I mean, we do a lot of blood gases in them to see if their oxygen is where it needs to be in their, their PF ratios and everything. So if, if you have those kind of caseloads, I think a blood gas analysis unit is justifiable, and I don't think it's extremely cost prohibitive to have it for those cases. If you don't, then, you know, recognizing that the pulse ox isn't necessarily the most sensitive indicator, especially when you're under anesthesia, uh, for recognizing oxygenation as, as that blood gas analysis. And recognizing the limitations of the equipment you have right. is important. And let's talk about that, because <laughs> there are going to be a lot of practices that probably don't have a blood gas analyzer, and they're using what they have for anesthetic monitoring. So what do you consider the foundation of equipment? All of it. No. <laughs> Besides all of it, yeah. <laughs> um, for anesthetic monitoring um, for a practice. So maybe there are technicians listening right now that are thinking, I really want to do more. I think we yeah. can do more for our patients and we only have blank. What are these foundational pieces that you think every practice should have? And you mentioned also that kind of added point that what you see may not be what is happening on the patient, right? So yeah. speak to that a little bit. The first thing any practice needs is a dedicated anesthetist to their patient that has taken time to make anesthesia at least an interest or priority in their career. No monitor can replace someone who's dedicated and attentive to the patient. Um, you get really good at monitoring a patient. Yes, all those fancy tools are helpful in indicating severities of situations and onset of situation, but we're, we're constantly looking at our patient um, and, and taking the whole picture together. Yes, the textbook answer is I want a multi-parameter unit that has capnography, um, an ECG, a pulse oximeter, um, a, you know, obviously an ability to measure body temperature and, and watch for that, but that doesn't have to be a part of your multi-parameter unit. Somebody with a stethoscope or the ability to feel pulses. Um, I think the ACBA does a great job of listing their guidelines for monitoring. So your ability to, to do that. Do you need an arterial line in every patient? No. Is that realistic? No. Is it great for every patient to have one? No, probably not. I would like it. You don't need it. You can, you know, monitor blood pressure and other means. And sometimes that's a stethoscope, a Doppler, and a dedicated anesthetist. Um, you know, you can do a lot with your eyes, ears, and fingertips. Um, so having someone trained and dedicated would be the one thing that has to happen. And I'm so glad you say that because <laughs> there's technological advances all the time, but I think we forget how much we can do just with us, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. And so for those technicians that might be in practices that aren't necessarily supporting a lot of continuing education in anesthesia or maybe some of the monitoring parameters that we'd love to have. Um, what are some other resources that they can be a part of or look into to feel more supported and get more information on their own? Well, the NERDS is very supportive of educational opportunities and frequently will list you know, educational opportunities as they present themselves in relation to anesthesia. There are textbook resources, going back to the basics, shadowing someone who has expertise. And, and it doesn't have to be a critical patient to learn how to monitor. And it can be a spay, neuter. Dentistry is honestly probably the highest, you know, for most practices, those are highest risk patients with the most diverse uh, histories and comorbidities. You can, you can do a lot of quality monitoring with lower risk anesthetic cases to be good Mm -hmm. at those, you know, more advanced cases. Um, and I think if you're using your resources, you know, buddy up with someone, ask questions, read, look up new things, um, know what's coming, know their limitations, and just practice it every day, and it'll build, you know, time with time. That's right. 
Thank you so much for all of this information. You. You're a great educator, and I know everybody's excited to learn from you tomorrow. And lots of great resources and tips for those watching at home who um, we all want to be better in anesthesia and pain management. And you're yeah, an absolutely. inspiration and a leader, and we thank you for all Just that you're doing. You. <laughs> yeah. We all are. So thanks. Have a great yeah. symposium, and we look forward to talking with you again. Excellent. We're excited. Thank you so much.